thank you very much. Um, and thanks to Conter and the Haven Wright Centre for inviting me. I should say, first of all, I'm really speaking here as a, a comrade, a fellow activist and friend of Neil's rather than as an academic, which is very important to stress because I'm actually on strike at the moment from my job as an academic. And if there's one thing that would definitely make Neil turn in his grave, it would be the thought that I was uh, crossing a picket line. So I'm not. Um, we're talking here as comrades. And it's a good place to start because although Neil's, what I want to say is that Neil's work, his thought on nationalism, national consciousness and the national question on Scotland, on uneven and combined development and theories of re or, and revolution, revolutions from above, it forms a coherent kind of whole. Um, it began, I think, it'd be fair to say, with his engagement with the national question in Scotland. And in particular, um, what should socialists' attitude towards the kind of revival or rise of Scottish nationalism be in the 1980s and 1990s? And it's important to say that this strategic question that Neil was trying to answer wasn't so much about support socialists uh, supporting or opposing nationalism as such, because Neil always argued, and I think correctly, that socialists never support nationalism and shouldn't support it. Um, that as a general set of ideas that nations should always have, a, each nation should have a state, and that each nation unites classes within it at the exclusion of those outside of it, that socialists should never support this. But that, um, in certain cases, socialists should support national demands. So demands for self, or demands for um, independence for certain nations or not. So <clears throat> trying to answer that question, and provide a direction to comrades here in Scotland meant for Neil going deeper, because he was a very deep thinker, into both the national question as conceived by previous generations of Marxists and what he thought would be, if not the answer to it, the way to, the way to, to pose that question, which isn't actually in terms of what Marx, Engels or other Marxists wrote about nations as such, but rather about the relationship between capital, the state, and ideology. And that actually national consciousness is a form of ideology, a dominant form of ideology um, in, uh, under capitalism. And I think it's, you could probably sum up, I think the main point that I'm gonna make or to sum up Neil's thought on the matter um, is that national consciousness is the result of a system of competitive accumulation mediated through a multiplicity of capitalist states and that the nation state or rather the multiplicity of many nation states so the fact that there are many nation states um, is the political form suitable to capitalism not the particular state not the state in the singular but the existence of many nation states and that national consciousness and therefore nationalism as a political expression of that arises from the uneven and combined development of capitalism both as a subjective experience and as a ruling class policy so that's the overall shape of what i think neil was arguing and what i'll explain more about but this began or this set of arguments began from Neil's engagement, as I say, with questions on the Scottish left in the 1990s. Um, the attitude towards to take towards Scottish nationalism, which, like all other nationalisms, uh, conceives itself to represent an old uh, nation, something that has always existed, or at least existed since uh, a long time ago and that that nation has something special about it, some kind of mission, destiny to be independent or to do something. And in fact, in fact, this is what makes Scottish nationalism really unremarkable 
and quite like all other nationalisms, because this is universally true of all nationalisms. But there's something distinctive about Scottish nationalism, not unique, there are other um, forms of national or other types, other nations, nationalisms that are like this, but it is distinctive, which is that national consciousness, so the sense of there being a Scottish nation, did exist for quite some time, for 200 years perhaps, um, certainly 150, without its expression in a nationalist movement. So there wasn't really a Scottish nationalist movement, uh, Scottish nationalist political parties until the 1920s, but there was Scottish national consciousness quite long before that. So that was the question that Neil was trying to answer in his two books in particular um, that were released in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, discovering the Scottish Revolution and Origins of Scottish Nationhood. This question of why had Scottish nationalism been so weak for such a long time when Scottish national consciousness was so strong? This meant getting back into a series of debates on the national question, so-called, um, which had featured amongst classical Marxists, so in the period of after Marx and Engels' death until the degeneration of the Russian Revolution, um, in the 1920s, when, of course, the, the prospect of, um, or the fact of multiple nationalities inhabiting the Russian Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, let alone the kind of colonial empires of France, Britain, and so on, posed that national question, which is often reduced to an argument between Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, but it was much wider than that. Um, but had been taken in its, um, let's say, most reductive form by particularly the Stalinist tradition in Scotland, so associated with the Communist Party, um, at first as a kind of reading of British history and then of Scottish history. So accepting <clears throat> the idea of uh, a def Stalin's definition of nations as a historically constituted stable community of people formed on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a common culture. And if you meet these tick boxes of a kind of characteristics, you've got a nation, and then that nation should be um, given the right to self-determination. And Neil had a big debate about this with <clears throat> particularly John Foster, a well-known kind of Communist Party tradition, historian of Scotland, demonstrating that in the particular case of Scotland that the novelty of the Scottish nation as opposed to the idea that it extends back to the 14th century or before um, but also the impossibility and in fact futility of attempting to have these tick box definitions that will somehow tell you this is a nation and therefore this unit that has been defined as a nation ought to have a state and actually to return instead to what he thought was the correct strategic position advocated by Lenin and he and also Marx and Engels that from the point of view of the struggle for socialism there are times when socialists should support uh, the self-determination of nations but and here um, Neil agreed with Rosa Luxemburg actually the idea that there's a right to self-determination of certain of nations is a metaphysical cliche, as he put it, because there's nobody to concede such a right. There isn't a kind of legislator above class struggle or above political struggle that can say this nation has a right and another does not. So this then meant Neil providing a kind of a alternative understanding of what we mean when we're talking about the nation to say that basically a nation is a, a community, a group, that is characterized by its acceptance of national consciousness. And that might seem like a tautology. So a nation is a thing that thinks it's a nation. But, Neil argued, <clears throat> first of all, that's, that's kind of fine. I mean, the important thing isn't whether there is objectively something you define as a nation or not, but whether uh, it's a political issue, whether it's something that um, impacts upon the struggle for socialism. But secondly, um, that the nation itself is something that has a historical, the idea of the nation, something that has a historical 
past. And it's connected to the uneven and combined development of capitalism. So the fact of there being such a thing as a nation comes into existence with bourgeois revolutions in uh, the Netherlands and England. And from that point on, it's possible to conceive oneself as a nation on that model. And that's what he means. This is um, slightly different or is a kind of attempt to answer the question in a new situation in the 1990s to the previous uh, model of distinguishing most often between oppressor and oppressed nations. And Neil agreed with doing that. For example, if you look at the Palestinians, they're an oppressed nation, therefore you ought to support their struggle for independence, for national recognition. Um, however, there are, Neil argued, in the 1990s, there were a series of kind of collapses of regimes, most of, most of all in Stalinist regimes in Eastern Europe, but elsewhere as well, that meant there were a kind of competing series of factions claiming national um, sovereignty that there's no way you could say this one group is progressive and this group is not. And it's kind of pointless to hunt the progressive nationality, uh, as he said. And the second point was that there was a development of new nationalisms or uh, neo-nationalisms in Tom Nairn's words in places like Scotland or Quebec or elsewhere, which are not oppressed, well, certainly Scotland, um, not oppressed, but are not in that aspect, at least, of their demands for self-determination, representing a kind of act of oppression, such as imperialism might. So it would be confusing to socialists to say just decide on the basis of this as an oppressed or oppressor nation whether you support this demand or not that rather it's something that's tactical essentially or is based upon um the particular situation that will aid the struggle for socialism so that means we have to go on a bit into what Neil's talking about when he talks about national consciousness, because he distinguishes between national consciousness, nationalism, and national identity. So this um, national consciousness, Neil says, is simply the mutual recognition amongst a group that they belong to a nation. But it arises, so this, I'm taking this from one of his earlier essays, which appears in the Haymarket uh, collection, Nation States, Consciousness and Competition. National consciousness arises through a process of constructing imaginary common interests, a construction that can result in the establishment of a territorial nation state. But only at that point will the nation have a material reality outside of consciousness. The resulting difference in aspiration may be summed up schematically by saying that a member of social class may achieve class consciousness i.e. bring their consciousness in line with reality, while a group with national consciousness may achieve statehood, i.e. bring reality in line with their consciousness. So he distinguishes, or he's comparing and contrasting class consciousness as uh, you know underlying relationship of which people do not always express themselves as a class in themselves, with national consciousness, which is a kind of construction of these imaginary common interests. I'll go on and say a bit more about how this construction came to happen in Neil's account of bourgeois revolutions because the nation is kind of central to the bourgeois revolution um, for Neil. But in the argument that Neil made about Scotland, national consciousness came to exist in Scotland because of the revolution from above, bourgeois revolution from above, pursued from the 18th century or throughout the 18th century actually against the pre-existing essential uh, feudal society. Um, before that time, there wasn't a Scottish nation, wasn't a Scottish national consciousness. So Scottish national consciousness is actually something that was developed um, after the union with England. And that's why it took such a long time, basically until the manifestation of imperial decline, uh, British imperial decline for Scottish nationalism uh, to emerge. In making these arguments, Neil was of course um, relating to other Marxist writing or other, let's say, uh, 
modernist accounts of nationalism, so people who argue that uh, nationalism is a recent phenomenon connected either to industrialization or to capitalism, but particularly in his engagement with uh, Tom Nairn and Benedict Anderson, so very obviously very famous um, theorists of nationalism, both associated with the New Left Review. Um, in his review, or his kind of review essay, on uh, Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, Neil makes a critique of Anderson where he outlines his own account of where national consciousness came from, where nationalism came from. So the problem for, I'm, I'm going to kind of assume that most people are familiar with Benedict Anderson's imagined communities argument, but if not very broadly speaking, he argues that nationalism is a recent phenomenon, it's connected to the rise of what he calls print capitalism, so the creation of vernacular languages um, based upon printing press and um, the kind of collapse of religious ideas of, um, of life, of, of time, and the replacement of those with the idea of the nation as the thing that's passing through time. So Neil's criticism of that is that it's kind of good as far as it goes, but that it wasn't, um, this idea of print capitalism is not enough to do the job on its own, to explain the emergence of nationalism, essentially in kind of early modern Europe, 16th, 17th century, when rather Neil points to four uh, connected phenomena, which are constitute essentially the rise of a, a capitalist mode of production, but which explain the development of national consciousness. And the first, he argues, are externally demarcated and internally connected areas of economic activity, uh, which are connected by a common language. So um, essentially groups of merchants, merchant capital, interacting with one another in a way that required them to have standardized texts. And as Neil writes, the increasing standardization of language then fed back into its original economic formation as the merchants whose trading networks had originally defined the territorial reach of linguistic comprehensibility increasingly identified themselves with that territory to the exclusion of rivals who spoke a different language. And we'll come back to this in a bit in explaining why Neil thought um, nation states and therefore national consciousness was functional for capital, why it needed them. The second point was that as absolutist states in Western Europe um, kind of defeated their or absorbed um, their feudal predecessors, they had to both justify their extraction from society or extraction of taxes from um, other classes and administer those. So that requires both a language and a bureaucracy and engage in military competition against other such absolutist states and formation, which requires some kind of loyalty beyond immediate bonds of uh, kinship or um, nobility, this kind of thing. So giving a kind of internal and external reason for the development of national consciousness. And then there's something that Neil actually didn't come back to. It's an interesting point, but um, he argued that Protestant, the Protestant Reformation actually had a big impact on development of nationalism and created by creating kind of national formations of belief which were identified with these um, these common these territories in which these linguistic networks were already developing. It's not something that Neil came back to so it'd be quite interesting to look perhaps what he what he meant by that but the big problem for um, Neil and Anderson's argument is the lack first of all of an account of of class really that goes beyond the existence of um, merchants using or print capitalists and secondly the absence of revolution 
of punctuations in this kind of story of the development of, of nationalism, which is very vital, really, to Neil's account. Because Neil, in arguing that this uneven and combined development of capitalism, producing, first of all, bourgeois revolutions in um, the Netherlands, England, and then kind of imitate uh, France, uh, revolutions from above in Scotland and elsewhere, produced a situation where, as he says, the struggle against absolutism required the mobilization of at least a large minority of, in quotation marks, the people, to achieve the expulsion or destruction of the royal dynasty. This could only be done by providing some form of identity which could embrace the often very different forms of opposition to the crown, regardless of whether the ruler in question was foreign, as in the case of the Spanish Habsburg dynasty in the Netherlands, or native, as in the case of the Stuart dynasty in England. Nationalism provided this identity. So the, the basically bourgeois revolution and the development of national consciousness are, 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 are connected. I'd probably note here that as we go on and talk about um, Tom Nairn, that Neil's article in um, the late 90s where he is kind of he goes over his review essay about Nairn's um, work is quite critical of Nairn um, basically I think correctly uh, for a kind of abandoning any se sense of a socialist project uh, in favor of the idea of the kind of liberation of small nations or micro states but you know there might have been a change in one or both of their ideas uh, over time and it might be worth coming back to that. But the main question that, or the main challenge that um, Neil was trying to meet in responding to Tom Nairn was the opening line of uh, the breakup of Britain. Uh, Tom Nairn's contention that the theory of nationalism is Marxist, Marxism's greatest failure. So Neil was saying it's not a failure, um, it's just not being done properly, perhaps. Where in the particular case of, I mean, obviously Anderson doesn't argue much about Scotland, but Nairn very much, particularly arguing about Scotland, um, that Scotland is a kind of appendage to the famous Nairn-Anderson thesis, where this um, late or, or kind of uh, pre-modern character of the British state allowed essentially uh, feudal absolutist state in Scotland, transformed but only by the Reformation, uh, to be appended to it, and then preserved by, or preserved in, only the, the church, the kirk, and in later kind of forms of romanticism. So Nairn focuses a lot on the, the kind of Walter Scott version of Scottish culture. Um, and even how it appears, he argues, in intellectuals who decry this uh, romanticist version of, uh, of Scotland, that they're still trapped within it. So Neil is probably fine with that, but what he argued against, um, and certainly with Nairn's positioning of the question of nationalism in Scotland and elsewhere as a response to uneven development, not uneven and combined development, um, but Neil's arguing that essentially the problem with Nairn is treating uh, the state and its operations as autonomous, as just something sitting at the top of society disconnected from um, class conflict, and therefore allowing Nairn to make the, the shift that he did after the disillusionment of, or the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and therefore the kind of disappointment that many of his cohort felt with that, uh, revealing what uh, Neil thought was the kind of underlying Stalinism of their perspective, um, replacing that um, body, replacing this kind of uh, project with nationalism as a, as a general principle, as something that would be progressive. So instead of having large states, they're just having smaller states is better. And this is what 
Neil said was a problem because it adds into another point that Neil was very uh, sharp on, very keen to make, that there's no distinction between so-called civic and ethnic nationalisms. That actually all forms of nationalism are perfectly capable of being as ethnic as the other. Um, and that this is t um, th there's no reason to distinguish between them other than um, how far they aid or impede um, the struggle for socialism. So, what then is Neil's particular account that he, or was Neil's particular account that he offered against these versions? First of all, um, as I said at the start, fundamentally Neil doesn't, didn't think that the place to look for a Marxist theory of nationalism is Marx's writing on, nas on nations. But rather, it's about the relationship between capital, the state, and ideology, in the sense of the, the sub, you know, the, um, our subject, subjectivity under capital. Um, there's a good point in his essay that he prefaces the edited volume, Nation States, Consciousness and Competition, where he sums up this argument, where he says that Capital requires multiple nation states, as no other state form, still less the absence of a state, could facilitate accumulation to anything like the same degree. And this links the two aspects of nation states, competition among rival states and national consciousness within the territorial area controlled by the state. The first unifies the capitals within the territorial area controlled by the state, and the latter divides the working class exploited within it. So this is, a, I suppose, a kind of mixture of a functional and a historical explanation for nationalism, for national consciousness. Um, he argues from this starting point, which was also a point being made by Colin Barker and others, that the political form most adequate to capitalism is not the state in the singular, but the system of states, multiplicity of states, in other words, of nation states, um, for the following kind of reasons, which are at an ab abstract level, not a historical explanation. So capitalism is obviously a competitive system. It's a system of competitive accumulation, but one in which capitalists do not wish to suffer the effects of competition. So each capitalist or alliance of capitals seeks to externalize those potential costs onto others. And those others are the other nations. That is what the state is there for. It would be impossible if there was a multiplicity of states. Um, and Neil actually writes here in his um, article that was originally in Cambridge Review of International uh, Affairs. The division into national territories has always helped to allocate where the devaluation or destruction of capital occurs, as one set of state managers attempts to protect their own capitals from the pressure of global crisis at the expense of other sets attempting the same. So the nation state is something that kind of unifies a territorially based fraction of the bourgeoisie against the outside, ex externalizing the costs of competition that they face. Another side of this relationship is that if, and he imagines or he kind of produces a thought experiment that let's imagine there's only one state in the world, but there are many capitals. There are still many, we have capitals in other words, a competitive system of accumulation. There are many different capitals. Well, he argues that would be the same as if there were no state that actually this would be equivalent to there being nowhere that these costs would be pushed. Capitals would have to, in, uh, each capitalist would have to um, bear it himself. What the state or the having the territorial, individual territorial nation state does is provides capitalists a way, and this is a point that Neil returned to a lot, um, a way of um, defending against themselves. So that if there were no 
territorially bounded state, that the world would be, or the um, capitalism would kind of function just like a, a series of um, armed competitors, which would eventually destroy each other. So um, this is what he writes here about that. The state cannot simply be the site of particular functions with no ideological attachment. Capitalists have at least to try to convince themselves that what they are doing is in a greater national interest, even if it's plainly in their own. Without some level of self-delusion, mere gangsterism will result. So there needs to be some kind of um, ideological attachment, some sort of link beyond simple material interest to make the state function. Otherwise, it'll just degenerate, Neil argues, um, into a war of all against all uh, amongst capitals. So that's on the side of, if you like, I guess the, the way that the ruling class, um, the ruling class uh, need or require, generate national consciousness and nationalism. But there's a second way, second aspect to it, which is that's functional the reproduction of capitalism, which is that the nation divides workers, as he says. In some sense, this is, um, this is actually uh, utilitarian, or this is an actual conscious policy. So it's definitely true that you, you can see this throughout the history of almost any state, the attempt to forcibly create educate and indoctrinate people into being members of the nation. It ha it's an almost a universal um, part of the development of a nation state. So there's a very clear uh, kind of conscious policy of creating nations that comes from the ruling class. But it's not just that, because Neil argues national consciousness um, which, of course, is a sense of identification that works against workers' class interest, is nonetheless one that it provides a psychological or subjective form of consolation, of meaning, in a world in which both the old fixed bonds of pre-capitalist societies are destroyed, so communities that people had belonged to before capitalism, and in which they're thrown into a world of constant change. So that even if you get used to, uh, we see this even in our own lifetimes, even if you get used to the certain way that capitalism functions, it changes swiftly. It's a constantly revolutionizing uh, mode of production, um, which produces a kind of need or an opportunity in the absence of revolutionary class consciousness for national consciousness to, to play that role. Um, it's also the way that day-to-day -day life is organized. And in fact, that reformist political parties and organizations, trade unions operate. So they reinforce the sense of national consciousness, both by the fact that generally reformist parties are very afraid to challenge the ideas of, of nationalism, simply for fear of being labeled unpatriotic, but also because they seek to govern the capitalist state. So it's not just in their imagination, or it's not just in their kind of untrustworthiness, but rather that they're seeking to govern this territorially bounded unit. And so it makes sense for reformist consciousness to be also national consciousness. Um, <clears throat> and this is kind of summed up here between, um, in this quote that I've got from Neil where he says, the spontaneous search for a form of collective identity with which to overcome the alienation of capitalist society um, is the, the root of national consciousness. National consciousness is therefore an alternative to class consciousness, but is rarely a complete alternative, since reformism is effectively the means by which nationalism is naturalized in the working class. But the other source is the deliberate fostering of nationalism by the bourgeoisie in order to bind workers to the state and through the state, bind them to capital. And Neil quotes, in fact, Anderson uh, quite well, I think, summing up this subjective aspect of national consciousness and its, 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 its uh, necessity 
for capital when he says that nobody would die for the EEC, um, that you need a kind of sense of meaning that goes beyond just material uh, interest or trade agreements or these kind of quotidian things in order to inspire attachment to the nation state, to offer that consolation. Um, so ultimately, of course, this is still a political question. And where I'd like to kind of finish up is opening this out to discussion on a, on a couple of points. The first is, Neil was always completely clear in all of his writing and his politics that, um, he says, in fact, writes it in one of his pieces, nationalism of any sort is part of the problem, not part of the solution. So he's always completely clear on that. But one of the criticisms that was made of Neil and of, of those of us who are his comrades, of course, was that we have taken a position of supporting the Scottish national demand for independence. And I think that's uh, a perfectly defensible one and coherently made by Neil um, in some of his later writings on the basis that this is both a way of weakening the British imperial state and a way of reaching um, Scot workers in Scotland who've been attracted to the project of an independent Scotland because of the belief that it offers a form of social transformation rather than necessarily of um, expression of national identity or national consciousness. And that in a choice between Scottish nationalism and the British nationalism represented by the kind of no side of the Scottish referendum, um, the British nationalist side is the bloodier one. Now, that's, I think, a point that's open for debate, and I'd be interested to hear other people perhaps expand on that, because a lot of people have been involved, of course, in the, were involved in 2014 and, and since then, and how we take on Neil, or we develop Neil's position to make a critique of the present Scottish government, basically, the SNP, um, as a fraction of the, generally, of the bourgeoisie. Um, a second point, which was really interesting, that Neil was working towards towards the end of his life. I mean, unfortunately, he he, he didn't um, survive long enough to write a, a book about it. Was about the connection between the right, fascism, national consciousness, nationalism. Um, he was, I think, working through some of these ideas, particularly on how the far right can pose a problem for capitalism. And part of that is to do with their um, relationship to, to nationalism. Um, but there are, also, there are also ways in which I think he, he made predictions that didn't stand up perhaps. I mean, he, he, for example, he did say, if defeated in 2020, Trump almost certainly will claim electoral fraud, but will not attempt to cling to power through a coup. So, it's interesting to see what, what Neil might have made of the following um, few years. But I think I will, I'm almost out of time. So I'll leave it there and hear what people have got to say. Thanks, Jamie. The, the silent clap, the silent Zoom clap <laughs> echoing through. Thank you so much for that, right? We'll go straight to Q&A. Um, I'm going to do it in rounds of three, if that's all right, Jamie. Um, great. Uh, you can do it by either hitting the reaction button and the raise hand or putting your question into the chat. So we'll have eyes on both. Um, so anyone would like to start off with any questions for Jamie? If I do um, say your name and you're on the video, it'd be great if you could turn your video on when you are asking a question. Um, okay, we'll start with David Jameson. Uh, yeah, hi folks, David Jameson, uh, editor of Conta. Um, I sort of wanted to touch on two very disparate points that Jamie raised, one a bit nerdy uh, and not particularly politically important, which is the point that Jamie made about the Reformation uh, being part of um, an important basis for national development in a number of different contexts. It's kind of the, the tragedy, one of the tragedies of Scottish history um, that there's not been a huge intellectual investment in, in the Scottish Reformation, either 
on the left or frankly anywhere. I mean, um, I asked a scholar on uh, who studies uh, the history of religion in Scotland recently, and he said that there was no sort of recognised history of the Scottish uh, Church, of the Church of Scotland, which is quite remarkable. I, I can't think of another national context where there isn't a single recognised volume history of, of the of the national, what was traditionally the national religion. Um, and he said, you know, it's partly because the church doesn't want to open its archives, and it's also partly because there's a profound disinterest in modern Scotland in the history of the country's religious life. But I think that's very strange um, because the Scottish case might be one of the most profound cases in which the Reformation laid the basis for modern nationalism because it established a few things. I mean, one of the ways in which the Scottish Reformation won uh, in Scotland was by... Um, inspiring a sense of patriotic resistance to, to France and to continental despotism and so forth. Um, and of course, it established its religious authority through a parliament and by overthrowing a monarch. So in many ways, it was a kind of precursor to what we would think of as the developments of a bourgeois revolution, but without the class content of, of a bourgeois revolution. And there's a very amusing intro to Neil's book, Discovering the Scottish Re uh, Revolution, where he says, look, I know loads of people in the Scottish left want there to be a Scottish levellers and we can associate a kind of popular revolutionary tradition that goes back to the founding of the nation, but it doesn't exist. And, you know, facts have to trump our romantic wishes for a, 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 a Scottish, you know, John Lilburn type figure. He's not there. Um, and we're just going to have to make do with the revolution from above that we got. Um, so I, but I, do, I do think that that would be a useful investment of time to, to, to consider that very particular investment and maybe build on some of the fragments that, that, that Neil produced um, in that. The, the second point I want to make is just to kind of relate to one of the questions that Jamie posed at the end. And it's interesting that Neil's two of his twin interests were the far right and the emergence of new formations of the far right in recent decades and the Scottish national question. Because what I think he was understanding or grappling with was that the decline of traditional class formations in the political sphere meant that the question of the nation, national consciousness, national identity had been thrown wide open in a phase of kind of political conflict. And we were all of us, I suppose, at that time trying to grasp, grapple with how do you deal with that in a particular Scottish context? But I think he was uh, perhaps viewing, seeing that the nation, and particularly in a period when traditional conservatism and traditional social democracy are both effectively spent as political forces, that the nation, the question of the nation will be a crucial intellectual battleground in politics for, for decades perhaps to come. Um, it's sad that we've, we've lost him on, on that journey, but I think his later work is worth reflecting on when we consider those problems. Thanks, David. Um, I've just got two more from the chat that I'll read out, Jamie, if that's okay. Um, that was a, a, a nice extended one from, from David, so I hope you made notes. From Seattle Revolutionary Socialists, we've got, Lenin made a strong distinction between nationalism of oppressor and oppressed. He said that the nationalism of the oppressed has a democratic and progressive content, whereas that of the oppressor does not. Did Neil agree with that? And then we have um, Bat who asks, how did Neil's conception of nationalism and the socialist position of critical antagonism towards it inform his analysis of the 2016 Brexit referendum? That was a question dominated by nationalisms on all sides, and he had a similar stance of siding with the breakup of the bigger imperialism. Um, I'll let Jamie answer those, and then I'll come to yourself, Buren. OK. <clears throat> um... So the first question uh, from David was about the Reformation, which could go on all night, really, um, an interesting discussion. Um, I think it's quite Ill it could be quite illustrative in that, well, first of all, you have to remember that what became the Kirk, the Kirk was not, most didn't embrace everybody who lived in Scotland until 19th century. I mean, people were still being converted to Protestantism in Scotland in the 19th century. Um, so it, it definitely was a proto-national formation 
and that is probably the reason why it's one the one thing or one of the three things that are all essentially super structural kind of uh, elements that were preserved within the union. So the law, um, the Kirk, and education. Largely because I think um, Neil would probably argue that the the, the fundamental ruling class were in, were being integrated into or offered a kind of position in the British state. Um, but we could go on a long time about this, I think. There's there's some stuff about it in Discovering the Scottish Revolution, but probably be nice if somebody went on and did a bigger project, perhaps. On the question of the decline of traditional class formations and the kind of rise of the far right or um, elements of national consciousness within it. I mean, I think so, some of the stuff Neil was writing towards the end of his life, and that was very interesting. And he would, but he was quite keen to distinguish between um, what he described as the hard right. So you're kind of UKIP. Uh, he probably would have put the, the kind of Trump type support in that grouping and the fascist right. And he he distinguished between them, saying, I mean, it's a fairly classical distinction that the hard right are not seeking to take over or abolish the kind of democratic elements of the bourgeois state and destroy um, destroy uh, working class organisation. Perhaps they don't need to, but the fascist right do seek to do that, and they seek to do through do so by the control of violence on the streets, which is uh, also a dangerous thing for. Um, uh, the ruling class for the actual kind of um, bourgeoisie. It's a problem for them, can get out of hand. So he was grappling, I think, with those two things. Uh, where he would have gone with it, I'm not sure. I think um, it would have been very interesting to develop his ideas about, or develop the ideas he basically took from the ABC, I think, of, of, of Marxism, um, that there's something about the formation of civil society from the abstraction of the market that leads to this conflict or perceived conflict between the kind of globalizing impulse of capital and the kind of and the national and the, the constellations of national consciousness. Um, but that's not something he specifically said. It might be quite interesting to to look at. Sorry. What was the next one? It was about uh, the oppressors and oppressed. Oppressors and oppressed nationalism, yeah. Okay, so I think Neil would probably... I'm just looking at it in the chat. Lenin made a strong distinction between nationalism and oppressed and oppressed. I think Neil would go along with that. Yeah, of course. Um, I don't think he would necessarily agree with the characterization of what Lenin said, but let's take that on. I mean, I think it's not the nationalism that has a de democratic and progressive content uh, of anyone. It's the national demands. And that this is Neil's argument. I, I agree with it. Um, the, the reason you'd support those demands isn't because nationalism has some kind of special character anywhere of anyone, but rather because in doing so, you break with the national consciousness that links workers in the imperialist or oppressor nation to the bourgeoisie of that nation and you undercut the claim to leadership of the oppressed nation by the bourgeoisie of that nation because rather than seeing the oppressor nation as one unit um, uniting the working class and the bourgeoisie that actually there's a working class within it that can unite with the working class of the oppressed and that the support for national demands of oppressed nations therefore help the struggle for socialism. So the, the, the question of whether to support or not dem national demands is subordinate to the struggle for socialism. It's not something that's inherent in the character of nationalism itself. Um, finally, EU. How did Neil's conception of nationalism and the socialist position of critical antagonism towards it inform his analysis of the 2016 Brexit referendum? 
Yeah, I mean, similar stance of siding with the breakup of the bigger imperialism. I mean, he took the fairly, I think, standard view that um, the EU is very simply an, an organ of the cooperation of capitalist classes within Europe, and that therefore to break it up is breaking up part of the series of institutions that um, at a global level perpetuate the capitalist order. NATO, European Union, IMF, and that's good. That's all you need to know. Um, and it, then in that may indeed cause further um, kind of ructions in British politics or further opportunities, but that, that's not something to be feared, I think you would have argued. Was that it? That's great. Thanks, Jamie. Viren, would you like to pose your question and then Grant, if you could come in after. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed this presentation and um, I like the way you were sort of putting uh, Neil's work into context. Um, my question actually, I think, uh, continues the previous question about um, oppressed and uh, oppressor type of nationalisms. Um, and I was wondering, it seemed like um, your presentation of, of Neil's work went in, in two slightly different directions. I mean, on the one hand, um, there is sort of the support for oppressed nationalisms. Uh, and maybe, you know, I, I would sort of want maybe think about it also as anti-imperialist nationalisms as well. Um, as uh, something that could be conducive to a socialist project at certain points. But on the other hand, there seems to be analysis, an analysis of the nation um, as something that is inextric inextricably connected to the capitalist system. Um, and I was wondering how to bring these two things together. And, I, and I'm thinking about this and, and, I'm, and, I, and I need to read more of Neil's work on this because I think there's he's there's parts of his work that sounds like it would be very sympathetic to third world marxism um uh, especially you know with its attempt to connect um anti-imperialist nationalism with a project of socialism um but on the other hand there is an attempt there seems to be a a reading of the nation state that is inextricably linked to the capitalist system which would suggest that any attempt to then use the nation would, would in some sense lead to a contradiction. And I, and I think here, the, 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 the question that, that's also interesting here is the link between say, the socialist states, the actually existing socialist states and the nation, because it, it almost seems to this be that he would be forced into a kind of state capitalist argument. And, and I'm not sure if that's where he's going, right? Because if you want to say that the nation state is inextricably connected to, to, to capitalism as a form, and then these socialist nations are using the nation state, um, then it seems like in some way they are linked to, to a capitalist form. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's where he wants to go. So I was just curious. Thanks. Uh, are we taking a few at a time or? Yeah, Grant, if you could come in now, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jamie. That was really, really interesting. Um, I think it's like quite timely as well. I think one of the things we're really needing to grapple with is the the malaise that's uh, descended over the independence movement, particularly the, the the left of the independence movement, and understand why we are, what the situation is that we're in just now. Um, so I've got a few points to make, and I'm, I'm building towards the question. So if you <laughs> bear with me, I mean, I think the success of the the pro-independence left in Scotland and the, the run-up to and immediate aftermath of 2014 maybe comes down to two key points. One was the, its ability to recognise the political moment uh, and mobilise around that. But I think we probably failed um, because we didn't manage to translate that as something that could put down solid foundations on which you could actually build, uh, build a, a, a wider movement around. So it was fragile and that fragility has just led to, to fracture, uh, and we are certainly very fractured at the moment. I mean, there's there's different approaches, either rip it all up and start again, 
some people want to recapture lost momentum. There's various shades of opinion between, and there's still a lot of illusions around uh, the, how the radical left and the SNP can cooperate together. I would argue they can't. I think that moment, that moment has completely passed, but there are still some illusions there. Um, so we recognise the moment, but I don't think we fairly fully managed to grapple with uh, the relationship between the, the national question uh, and class. I would also pose a question of whether um, this is still the terrain that we are likely to be, the main terrain that we're going to be fighting on. We've got industrial unrest, um, you and I and a few others in this call are obviously in the, <laughs> the third of 10 days of uh, industrial action with more dates to follow and there's plenty of other instances of uh, industrial disputes over the, the recent period. We've got climate crisis and we've got this growing cost of living crisis which uh, is, is um, the, the, the focal point of, of a lot of struggles at the moment. Um, so my, my question is, I was trying to work out to phrase this question, it, it started off with what do you think Neil would say and I don't think that's actually the question I'm asking. Want to ask what I think of what I'm wanting to say is how can we how can we better use Neil's analysis to, to understand the moment we're in now and avoid some of those mistakes that we've made on the, the road from 2014 to the present. Thank you, Grant. We've got um Dragan as well. If you'd like to put your question to James and then if you want to uh, reply, Jamie. Yes, yes. I, I tried to I tried to make it reasonably brief. Uh, thanks, Jamie, for that, and that was very interesting and uh, um, uh, and valuable. I thought uh, that, that you. I wanted to go to the to the to the useful points you made about um, Neil's critique of Anderson, um, and just to say a word or two about that, and wondered what you thought about this, and in particular, a, a problem I have, which 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 I think applies in a sense to Anderson, but also to Neil on this whole question of where the nation comes from, how it arises, so to speak. Um, because in a sense, and I, you know, I may be oversimplifying a little bit, but in a sense, what they are both kind of saying is that the nation somehow emerges from this, in a sense, culturally homogenizing impact of capitalism. Um, Anderson emphasizes this as kind of you know that this emerging from print capitalism very narrowly, whereas I think more correctly, in my view, Neil emphasizes the emergence of capitalism as a whole system, a total system. But the problem I have with both approaches, and this is where, where I kind of struggle to kind of um, uh, uh, um, put this together into a kind of coherent set of steps that I can see in my own mind, so to speak, about how we, how we therefore get from this homogenizing process to this thing called the nation as an idea. And this is where I struggle, both with Anderson and with Neil on this. You know, in Anderson's case, for example, you know, you read these newspapers, you start speaking the same language, whatever it is, you see links with others. Yeah, but why does this, why is this emerge as the nation? is the question. And this question of the specificity of the nation idea is what I cannot see emerging from their underlying analyses. And that's my, that's my, that's my problem. Uh, I think that's a problem with a lot of Marxists writing on this question. I, so I don't think that's particular to them, but I think they come closer to kind of getting us somewhere, but I still don't feel altogether happy with it. Anyway, that's my question really. Thanks. Thank you, that was great. Um, do you wanna come back on those three points, Jimmy? Sure, great questions. Um, so first of all, on Viren's point, I think it's really vital um, because it's probably where it's probably where the main debate is going to happen politically. And I would say, so you you posed the question as there being these two uh, streams or two or contradictory things you saw in the talk or in Neil's thought as on the one hand, the analysis of a nation as inextricably linked to, to capitalism, and on the other, as a support for, you know, national demands, or you said nationalism, or in some cases of a kind of third world liberation project. Um, I think, and I, I would agree with Neil, I can't speak for Neil, 
you know, can only say what's in his books, which everyone else can see. Um, that, again, just to reiterate, he's quite clear, and I would agree with him here, that he doesn't think nationalism has a progressive character wherever it happens. That it is always and everywhere about the unification of contradictory um, class interests within a community that has this national consciousness that supposedly overcomes those interests. And that would be the case anywhere. That therefore, yes, that if you, I mean, let's pause it. it Let's pause it in terms of Scotland. If you're supporting the national demand for um, Scottish independence, the reason to do that, even though others like the SNP might support it for different reasons, the reason to do that is in order to abolish Scotland. That that is the final horizon that we seek, and that that would be true anywhere, uh, because I think he does argue that the nation state is inextricably linked. Um, to the world of to capital and that when one and i think this has been demonstrated i would probably argue that the attempt to create kind of forms of sovereign national development um even with the best will in the world runs up against that fact and leads to or led to eventually um the kind of collapse or reversion of national liberation regimes from the 80s onwards um, into uh, cooperation uh, with the, the global system they previously opposed. And that that's not just a matter of betrayal, it's not just in the mind, it's because of limiting the horizon towards the establishment of the independent state, rather than to the abolition of the state, which I think is what Neil saw as the end goal and the support of foreign national demands as well. First of all, simply democratic uh, duty to support op oppressed peoples and having a choice about their future. Um, but secondly, as something that um, aids in bringing about that future or bringing about that essentially socialist future by attacking imperialism. And that you don't have to be a nationalist in order to be an anti-imperialist. Second point, um, Grant, about how can we better use Neil's analysis to avoid the mistakes we've made since 2014? Um, well, that's quite hard. <laughs> I mean, that's really unfair uh, to ask someone that. Um, I think... Okay, so it's just an unavoidable fact that the movement that we hoped in 2014 would kind of resolve its or go in a more leftward direction it has been absorbed into the SNP vote. Um, and to a kind of um, dominance, really, that's very hard to shake and hard to, to chip into. And I think that the, okay, you mentioned a few points of basically class demands, class struggle that are coming up, that um, the only way to really chip away at that, I think we, personally, I think we probably need to turn our fire a bit more on the SNP, rather than let them get away with just saying it's all down to Westminster. Um, and that uh, actually the reason that they're postponing the referendum constantly, they'll postpone it forever, the, the SNP, because they're in the position that they want to be in. They've got as much administrative power that they, they feel they can handle. And to put them in a position where they actually are in, you know, in the position of a, a nation state where you're choosing between as state managers, the bourgeoisie, the global bourgeoisie, and um, working class, they don't want to be forced into that position, basically. Um, so I'm not entirely sure they ever actually will call a referendum. But I think, yeah, we could do with a bit more uh, 
We shouldn't let them off the hook just because they don't like Boris Johnson and nobody else likes Boris Johnson. Um, that wasn't a very that wasn't a very clear strat strategic way forward. I'm aware. On Dragon's point about okay Anderson and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but you seem to be asking about what are the intermediate steps between this kind of impulse of capital and development of national consciousness. So, hmm, I don't think I can answer for Neil here, um, but I think we can look at his, I mean, both him and Anderson, I think, do produce, um, do, do give you reasons or accounts of how particular policies were produced, you know, developed the ideas of national consciousness and they had to be made with an effort. It had to be done uh, through, you know, schools, uh, national linguistic unification, this kind of thing. So that does exist. But on the question of why, the, I guess, the nation as a, as a particular kind of unit or concept, um, I think we might have, I think there, there is an argument, not Neil's, mine, that there are things in European history that were more, that were used, certainly. So the idea of the nation as a kind of particular linguistic group that um, really appears in the kind of Catholic Church or the, the universities and, and canon councils of the Catholic Church, that a nation refers to the people who speak the particular vernacular within that institution, right? Not the whole people. That was a kind of available term, which isn't the same elsewhere in other parts of the world. You know, you don't, if you look at other uh, Ottoman Empire or places like that, there are referred to particular um, religious groups or areas that people come from, but it's not, so not linked to a concept of, of things possessing a language. That's just my, you know, having a go at that question, that's not something Neil argued. Cheers, Jamie. We've got um, Leslie and then Jen. Thank you very much indeed for the most wonderful introduction, uh, Jamie. And I apologize, this is not going to be a question on the same level as other participants in the discussion, but um, just try to clarify things by my own mind. Would it be correct to say that nationalist movements should be supported if they are a anti-imperialist in the case of Scottish independence leading to the breakup of the British state, uh, that they are favourable towards the greater unity of the working class across national borders and ultimately international in the case, for example, of English workers hopefully supporting a struggle for an independent Scotland, and thirdly, that if this nationalist movement uh, results in a greater in an increase in class consciousness in the working class, as I think was referred to in the idea, you know, a few years ago, that uh, the, the the nationalist movement at the time was much further to the left than it is now. That this is the third reason why a national movement should be supported. If it doesn't meet these criteria, there's probably a problem. And I just also like to say I agree very much, Jamie, with your point that we should be an awful lot harder on the SNP and the the Sturgeon, um, the Scots government, the Scots, yeah, and the SNP in general. With, the, with, with the, of course, there are some very good sources in the SNP, I should not forget that. I don't want to sound sectarian. My apologies if I did. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. And that was a, a great uh, level of question, just as good as everyone else's. So, um, Jen, uh, would you like to come in and then we'll have Charlie and then back to you, Jamie. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, hi everyone. It's nice to see you all. Uh, I'm in I'm in Moscow, where class consciousness is a, a dirty word at the moment. Um, I'm really I did, on a completely you know not not a question. I'd just like to say how how glad I was to see that everyone's getting together to talk about Neil's work and his legacy, mm -hmm. and what a what an enormous impact he had on our lives, as as a person, let alone as as an intellectual, as an academic. Um, so I'm really glad this is happening. Thank you. I wanted to ask 
<laughs> I'm glad that David talked about the Kirk because it's a thoroughly unfashionable topic, but I was raised in the Kirk and it's where the, the, the people in my very, very rural island community is where the debate would happen because they still believed in this um, this idea of debating the word of God, of, of, of thinking about it deeply and having a, a flight in. And I still think there's an element that clings on in that, even though the carcass is pretty much dead in so many places. But I don't really have a question about that. I'm just glad that somebody brought it up, about that intellectual legacy. I'm wondering, where, where do you think, Jamie, the radical critique and action are going to come from? Because sometimes it's quite unpredictable where it came from. And I think for some people on the left, 2014 was quite a big surprise. And it's not like that happened by accident. You know, it was, it was a lot of people in this talk and others who made that happen. But the circumstances were very fortuitous. The, you know, the debate went that way and it was easy to push it that way. So will we see another another moment like that um, of possibility, radical possibility and rupture and looking at society, like where might that come from, do you think? A lot of radicalism seems to be from my, I'm completely out of the loop, but you know, there's been the climate youth stuff and there was always that radicalism in the climate movement, but it was sort of disparate and confused. And there seems to be this weird kind of amnesia in that movement or in lots of movements now where the people don't generally know or it's kind of uncool to know about all the struggles that came before and even recently you know they're like doing radical action but they're not aware of the roads movement and the stuff where all those methods and tactics came from and that's interesting in itself like intellectually like how did we get to such a point of amnesia where people don't remember or aren't interested in in what just came before so i'm always looking for some kind of hopeful moment if you can provide that thanks Thank you, Jen. Um, Charlie, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Um, Leslie's reference to winning um, workers in England to supporting Scottish, independ Scottish independence made me think back to the arguments that Neil that Neil made along along those along those lines in the eighties and nineties, and what you might, I suppose, slightly schematically call the different tasks of socialists in Scotland and socialists and socialists in England, because I mean, I'm, 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 I'm in London. Um, I don't think talk, I don't think talking about Scotland for me starts with criticizing Nicola Sturgeon. I think it starts with saying Scotland has a right to be independent if it wishes to be. Um, I, you know, not to sort of contradict Scottish comrades uh, criticisms of Sturgeon, but the reality is that you know, Scottish workers would be better off not being not being subject to Boris Johnson, as would the rest of us. But you know, you have a more immediate possibility of that um, than we do. And but it and, and but it did make it did make me think that when we talk about the different forms of nationalism, that I think one of the important differences is not simply saying that all nationalisms are equally reactionary, but actually there are different levels of contradiction. Some Sc Scottish nationalism, it seems to me, is contradictory. English nationalism, British nationalism um, is wholly reactionary. And that's, an, that's, you know, that's an important distinction. So there are Scottish national demands, which can be supported, Welsh national demands, because it seems to me that much of what Neil argued applies as well to Wales. It's, it's always a pity that Socialists and Wales haven't taken up those arguments to the same extent, but British nationalism, English nationalism, is the enemy, pure and, sim pure, pure and simple. And um, I'm not aware that Neil, or oh, perhaps you, perhaps you could say about this, I'm not aware that Neil ever wrote much about British nationalism or English nationalism, perhaps because he just took it for granted. But are there places where he does this? Thanks, Charlie. I'm going to squeeze in one last question, Jamie, and um, just because this is the last round. And um, so it's from Seymour Clear. It's in the chat. It says, is the nation state an obsolete political economic technology? If yes, what sort of social relations or social organizations have you imagined in lieu of the nation state? 
And with that, if you would kindly answer the, the three, four great questions and maybe make some concluding remarks to, to round up. Thank you. Thanks, Alice, and thanks for all the questions. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Leslie, I thought, I mean, your, your point was great. To, and basically, I, th I think I, I agree with it. Um, the, the, the way you laid it out, I thought was actually a lot more concise than I did. Um, there, are, I think Neil probably would say, and I think it'd be a fair point that you don't want to be too schematic, you know, like a set of points that says this one, this one, this one, this one would do it, this one, this one, this one would do it, would be perhaps a bit formal. Um, but broadly, I, I agree. Um, on Jen, I mean, I also agree with Jen about remembering Neil and uh, you know the enormous impact he had. It's very unfortunate that we haven't been able to see each other actually in in one place um, because of you know, the time when he died. And I think we're coming come back to this, but the the position of the Kirk and also of a religion, religious identification and belief within Scottish nationalism, but as a kind of bigger part of nationalism, I think could do with more attention. And also people maybe forget how religious, how important it was in Scotland until how recently, and definitely until, my, until I was born, I would say for sure. Um, and how actually, I would say that one of the things that made the 2014 result possible was the fact that in the intervening period since 1979, it had become possible for Roman Catholics to be considered part of the Scottish nation, which was probably still not around uh, in the 70s, that it was still quite a distinction that if you were, Scotland did mean the Kirk. And there was always this hint of, I mean, this was George Galloway and his argument for voting no made it and it was no longer had the purchase that it did but it would it, people used to say this quite a lot that if basically religious minority catholics would be left alone with protestant supremacy in an independent scotland it'd be dangerous and therefore you shouldn't vote for it um something happened in the 80s to do with deindustrialization, i think and to do with um the general kind of collapse of organizations of civil society of which a church is one, churches are one, um, that change that. And I think that that's worth digging into. Um, on where's the next, hmm, where's the next front likely to be? I don't think I can answer that question, to be honest. I mean, Neil was fond of quoting Den Daniel Ben Said, saying that there's something will flow somewhere but you don't know where it will be but i think the point that you make about amnesia is very relevant it's really visible in all of the kind of movements that we see that can be very uh, very vibrant very progressive um but also lack any sense that for example people have spoken about racial oppression before that actually there is a debate about these things or about social reproduction or that this has happened before. And by that is, I think, down to the end or the collapse of serious socialist movements and parties that would have continued that kind of understanding, you know, that, a memory, um, a kind of institutional memory of the class, which is absent. Um, I think that's one reason for it. On Charlie's uh, questions, so there was this sort of concrete question of did Neil write about English nationalism? Or, I mean, are we talking here about English nationalism or British nationalism? There are different places that he touched on those. So in the debates about the referendum um, and in, in his Radical Philosophy article, I think, he does talk about British nationalism, but he doesn't have a, such a, a kind of theoretical approach to it. Um, about English nationalism, I mean, he's mentioned it, I think, in relationship particularly to UKIP and questions of the far right. But again, it wasn't 
it wasn't something you wrote full length piece on, uh, as far as I know. I'm not, it's not something we've come across anyway, in this unpublished work. Um, on the question of nationalism's character, again, I think this is a central argument. It's really interesting that we come back to it. Um, are all nationalisms equally reactionary? I mean, I would again just reiterate the point that I think Neil was great at making that for him and also for me, Marxists should not support nationalism as a strand of thought, uh, as a political belief. That is not something we should do anywhere, but that national demands can be worthy of support. But he did make an, an interesting, he had an interesting phrase where he said, there's no limit to how reactionary any nationalism can be. But there is a limit to how progressive the effect of any nationalism can be. And the reason for that is that even once you've liberated a nation, created a, a nation state, fought an anti-imperialist struggle, it remains within the context, within the framework of that system of multiple states that is uh, determined by capital. That's the limit to how progressive they could ever be. But on the other end, national, nationalism can be infinitely reactionary. I mean, up to and including, you know, fascism and wars of extermination. I don't think that's, um, I don't think that's likely to be declared from Holyrood anytime soon. I mean, I think we can rest easy in our beds that Sturgeon is not planning genocide of any sort and there are different responses or answers I think socialists should prioritize not make but prioritize depending on where they are that's totally normal um, but I do think that especially I mean since the kind of um, nature of the SNP's projects become very clear through the growth commission and other documents that there's no reason to there's certainly no reason to um, backpedal on any criticism of them. Final question was from a Seymour Lee, Seymour Clear Lee. Is the nation state an obsolete political economic technology? If yes, what sort of social relations, social organisations have you imagined in lieu of the nation state? Um, I mean, the obsolete is, in what sense, yeah, we should get rid of it, is what I think. Um, but it clearly it performs a function. It performs a function for the system of capitalism. So we can't just imagine it will disappear or, or cause it to disappear without dismantling that system. Which leads on to the answer to your second question. What sort of social relations or social organisations have you imagined? Um, I mean, lots of people have different imaginations. And I, I think it's probably not up to me to... Um, kind of suggest one for everyone. But just pretty clearly the one in which um, the free development of all is the condition of the free development of each. Um, just communism, really. I mean, so the abolition of private property uh, and the state. That's easier said than done, of course, and takes multiplicity of forms and how people are doing that. I mean, whether it takes a form of a workers' council that leads to eventually the abolition of the distinction between the political and economic, or it's something more like kind of local forms of communes, like the Paris Commune, or other experiments that we've had even more recently, I think is open for debate. And I think that that's maybe a good place to end it, because I think that's what Neil wanted too. Um, that it should always be remembered that that's what he wrote for and that's what he what he lived for so i'll leave it there thank you jamie that was a perfect note to end on um i'm just gonna thank all yourselves everyone there's a lot of you this evening so it's great that you all came out um or stayed in <laughs> um i'm also going to thank the havens rights center for co-hosting you can go to their website to sign up to their future talks, which look great. Um, you can also go to contour.scot, sign up to our mailing list, and you can sign up to our Patreon if you like the stuff there. 
Um, and I think probably most importantly, ending on um, an encouragement to donate to the Neil Davidson's library project and just continuing on his legacy in the work that still needs to be done on this. So I hope you all have a good and healthy evening. And thank you once again, Jamie. Good night. <laughs>